starting our new series, and the new series title is Breaking Addictions, The Road to Victory. You'll notice it doesn't say the road to recovery. It's the road to victory. Kind of the theme verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 57, that we have been given the victory in Christ Jesus. But I want to read to you another victory passage, Romans chapter 8, if you'll turn there. Romans chapter 8. As you're turning there, we're going to begin at verse 31, but Romans 8 is a wonderful passage of Scripture that talks about uh, the devastation of creation, uh, the devastation upon believers, how that makes creation groan, how it makes us groan waiting for our adoption, how, how the Holy Spirit groans as He intercedes for us and talks about us being heirs with Jesus Christ and joint heirs. It talks about the fact that we who are born again have been born again on purpose, for a purpose, by the sovereign grace of God. And because of that, we have verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. As we think about addictions, we have to acknowledge that Christians can be addicts. It's not just the heathen world that are addicts. Many Christians are. As we go through this series, I'm going to try to be as gentle, as sensitive as possible, but there are going to be things that might be embarrassing. So I just kind of want to warn you about that ahead of time. Uh, But the reality is that addiction is a plague on humanity. Now, we were created to have habits. Can you imagine what it would be be like to not have habit capacity? I, I love driving a vehicle. What if you had to learn every day what that thing is for? Where does it go? What's that noise when the engine starts? If we didn't have habits, I mean, do you really have to think? I pull out my key, I stick it in the ignition, I turn it, I know what it sounds like when it starts, I let loose of it, I put it in drive, I go after I buckle up. I go. Now, habit. Sometimes I go on autopilot and I go the wrong direction. That's not the vehicle's problem. That's that's human error, operator error. But we have habits. Uh, We we have habits that drive us. God created us with the ability to form habits. It's a blessing to have habits. The problem of sin is those habits turn into addictions those habits become controlling, ruling, sinful desires where we're no longer in charge. They rule us. 
if you watch TV, and I'm watching less and less and less of it because there's just nothing on, um, if you watch TV and if you've been around for a while, some of the most simple TV shows have addicts in them. Take cartoons, for example. Some of your favorite cartoon characters, if you're a little older, remember Shaggy and Scooby? What do you think they were addicted to? Pot, right? What gives the munchies? Totally. He was on pot. He was always hungry, or he was a food addict, because he always wanted food. What about Mighty Mouse? Mighty Mouse snorted cocaine right on TV. Sorry to burst your bubbles, but he was a coke addict. What about, what about uh, Wimpy, Popeye's friend? He was a food addict. I mean, one, one hamburger was not enough. Or he came out with a whole platter full of hamburgers. Uh, what about Underdog? Underdog had his ring with this magic energy pill. He was a PCP addict. What gave him super strength? What about Popeye? Definitely on roids. You don't get forearms like that by nature. Uh, what about Homer Simpson? I don't watch it, but Homer Simpson. A raging alcoholic. Okay, so some things sub, such as cartoons, they, these people don't do what they do by accident. The addictions are built into the cartoon character. We're not going to even talk about TV that's not cartoons. Our goals for this series are threefold. First of all, to identify addictions as sin and not sickness. Every addiction is a sin issue, not a sickness issue. Now, there can be medical side effects to them. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what drove the person to be the addict in the first place. It was a sin issue. The second goal is to give people the hope of Jesus Christ. Outside of, outside of Christ, there's no hope for the addict. He or she will just replace one sin with another. And the third goal is to give a clear outline for victory over addictions. Not recovery, victory. Uh, one of the themes of Alcoholics Anonymous is that even if you never drink again, you are still a recovering alcoholic. That's your label, that's your title, that, that's what you did, that's what you are. So forever, if you were an alcoholic, forever you'll be an alcoholic. What we want to do is we want to lose those labels because we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The series is broken into four parts. first part of a few sermons are going to be on is addiction sickness or sin? Because if it's a sickness, we're going to deal with it in a totally different way. If it's a sin, we're going to deal, it, deal with it in a biblical way. Is it getting rid of those strongholds, identifying them, and now getting rid of them, getting rid of the strongholds in our lives. We also want to talk about what does a surrendered life look like. Sometimes we think that surrender to Jesus Christ means that God takes all the fun out of life. He's given us everything richly to enjoy. As I said in our training hour, our problem because we're sinners is if I enjoy it, I want more of it. And when I get more of it enough, I have a habit. I have an addiction. And then lastly, what is set apart living? Set apart to Jesus Christ. Set apart living that doesn't go back any longer to those things. So the first thing we're going to need to do if we're going to understand addictions is we've got to define it biblically. We've got to identify it biblically, so if we're going to identify it biblically, we have to understand how the world identifies or defines addiction. 
Webster defines addiction as, and this is an online version of Webster's Dictionary, a compulsive need for and use of habit-forming substance characterized by tolerance and by well-defined physiological symptoms upon withdrawal. Persistent, compulsive use of a substance known by the user to be harmful. Well, that's the world's definition of addiction. It's not the Bible definition. We have to identify what that word or define what that word compulsive means. Because that's been mentioned twice in here and it's used a lot in um, the, the worldly realm of dealing with addiction. That it's compulsive. The word compulsive means caused by a desire that is too strong to resist. Impossible to stop or control. Not able to stop or control doing something. That's what the word compulsive means. So we have to ask, are all addictions compulsive behavior? And I believe the answer is no. They're choices. They're always choices. They may be difficult choices, particularly when you go to break them, but they're always a choice. So biblically, let's define addiction this way. Addiction, all addiction is the act of one or a person submitting to some ruling and destructive master. What that means is, I know this thing isn't good for me. I know that doing too much of it is bad for me, but I am going to do it anyway. That, that's what addiction means. I know the facts. I know this is bad. I choose to keep doing it. What about heroin? Is that an addiction? Yes. Is it compulsive? There's an inner drive because of the addiction to keep on doing it, but no one has to buy the heroin. No one has to snort it or shoot it. That's a choice. No, I'll go through withdrawal, it'll be horrible. Yes, but you still have a choice. It's always a choice. So when we think about these addictions, we're going to come at it from a truly and purely biblical perspective. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 says, The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. That's addiction. It is an iniquity, a sin, which holds or ensnares an individual. Once you go down that path, once you start down that path, you open the door to enslavement. And once you become a slave of that master, he does not want you to become free. He will hold you fast. And in the end, if there is no victory... One dies because of his great folly. That's addiction. There is a, if not a physical death, there's at least a, a, a spiritual and emotional death. The person who's addicted doesn't really live. They don't live the kind of life that God wants them to live. So the goal of this series is to help people who find themselves being addicts to find the freedom in Christ through victory in Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this, that often we approach the subject of addiction or any sinful habit with a psychological bent of, give me a pill that helps me not do this anymore. Think about it this way. It was a choice to begin the habit. It has to be a choice to get rid of the habit. Well, what about babies born? Always there's an exception to things that still 
they, don't, they can't choose. Someone has to choose for them, and doctors will get them off of the habit, even though the baby can't choose. So we, we, we have to rein in our tendency to think of the illogical or the most extreme. The reality is that there, there are exceptions, not to this rule, but there are things that are beyond our control in all circumstances. But we don't have to drive to the casino and spend money. We don't have to open the bottle of booze and drink it. We don't have to light up. We don't have to do the things we do. They're choices. Steve Gallagher, in his book, Irresistible to God, made this statement. Life is a long journey made up of millions of daily decisions. A person's path can be altered at any time. But the longer he goes in one particular direction, the more inclined he will be to continue in it. Just like an addiction to drugs or sexual activity, the passions, the passion of pride can so dominate a person that it dictates the course of his life. This, in turn, places him in a rut which becomes increasingly more difficult to break out of, but not impossible. Difficult. Let's, let's face that head on. Difficult doesn't mean impossible. We often link the two, that difficult is impossible, and it is not. Difficult means Difficult. Impossible means I cannot do it. And often what I hear in counseling is people say I can't. What they really mean is I won't. I won't. So we have to begin to define things right. I can't means I don't have the ability or the capacity to do something. I won't is just stubborn rebellion. So I want to be sensitive to addicts. I want to give hope. You are not a victim. You've made choices. The way out is through Christ and his strength. And there is a way out. You don't have to live as a victim. Addictions come in all different forms, but can be reduced to three categories. And the Bible does us a great service by reducing all addictions to three categories. I like short, short lists, don't you? They, they give me hope. So here are the three categories. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, some of your translations say the lust of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, or the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Those are the three categories that all habitual sins fit into. Let's talk about the lust of the flesh first. The lust of the flesh simply is whatever I can get to make me happy. Whatever pleases the me in any form, whatever pleases me and I have to have and I will not be happy unless I have it, that is the lust of the flesh. We all fall victim of that because we're in sin. Stephen Kathy Gallagher. Steve Gallagher's history, you can go on Pure Life Ministries and read a little bit about his history, but Steve Gallagher's history was as a sexual addict who literally left his family for a life of sin. And God redeemed him and brought him back. And he, he repented, he was restored, he was trained, he went through a time of, of real conversion and repentance and began a, a ministry called Pure Life Ministries. He's written a lot of very, very helpful books. One of the ones that I use in counseling is At the Altar of Sexual Idolatry. Uh, very, very helpful book. And 
he and his wife have written several books, and she's written books for, for wives whose husbands have uh, become sex addicts. It's not just men, by the way. It's women as well. But they, in one of their books called uh, Creating Me a Pure Heart, Answers for Struggling Women, they write, the flesh longs for gratification at any cost. It always seeks that which is sensual and satisfying. That, that habit capacity, that, that God-given ability to create habits because of the curse of sin becomes also the habit to have life-dominating sins in our lives. Things that we just go to, we don't have to think about it. Things that call us so strongly that it feels like we can't resist it. That's the flesh continually calling out. And understand that, that for you, at that moment, it is the lust of the flesh. For me, at that moment, it is the lust of the flesh. But I'm not a victim of that. I can have victory in Christ. The second is the, pride, is the uh, lust of the eyes. The lust of the eye simply is whatever I can look at to make me happy. Whatever I can look at to make me happy. Again, our cartoon figures show us the lust of the flesh. Pepe Le Pew. Okay. Others who... That their eyes pop out of their head, their heart is beating out. They, they really show what it means to have the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes. And, and to want something because I see it and it gratifies me. In a book entitled Biblical Faith, Doctrines Every Christian Should Know, you find this statement. Satan does not always tempt men by affliction by making things really difficult. He knows people will also turn from God if they are tempted to love the world. Satan appeals to the carnal nature in men, urging them to gratify their sensual de desires at any cost. He would have all believe that self-gratification and pleasure are the only goals for life. God God gave most of us the gift of sight. It's a wonderful thing. He created things with beauty so that we could behold them. The problem is, because of sin, we don't just admire beauty, we lust after it. It becomes a ruling passion. And the eye gate causes us to look too long, to stare too often, to view things that are not right. And when we go down that road, it is a difficult path to come back from. Because unlike other addictions where you can take the alcohol away, you can take the drugs away, you can take some of the food away, with sexual addictions, the thoughts are always in your head. And you can, you can recall them at a moment's notice. And lest we think, like some people say, you can look, just don't touch. Looking is just as sinful. Jesus confronted the Pharisees on this. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in, her, in his heart. Jesus took the law to the next level. Don't look. Don't lust. We need God's grace. We are, we are weak beings because of the curse of sin. The third one, the pride or the boasting of life. In other words, whatever I can do to make me better than others. I can get more education. I can have a better job, I can have a bigger house, I can have a newer car, I can have this, I can have that, so that people will go to me, look at me and go, ooh, I wish I had a life like yours. 
I, I wish I had the things that you have. Steve Gallagher wrote another book called Intoxicated with Babylon, subtitled The Seduction of God's People in the Last Days. And in that little book he wrote, the pride of life is a person's exaggerated estimate of his own value as a person. Self-ambition, a drive to be successful, to have more prominence, an urge to keep up with the Joneses, or a prideful desire to be the one. These are evidences of the pride of life. I've been doing biblical counseling for over half of my ministry years. I've been in ministry for 30 years, and so for over half I've been doing biblical counseling. I know me as well. The number one thing that keeps us enslaved to sin is pride. It comes in this form. It comes in several forms, but it would come out like, I can't believe that I could do. And so we beat ourselves up, and the more we beat ourselves up, the more that thing appeals to us because we found pleasure in that thing. Or pride comes at, life is really treating me unfair. I deserve to be pleasured, so we go to whatever it is we go to. And we find that pride is in every little nook and cranny of our lives and and it captures us. So many times the scriptures talk about pride or humility. And a proud person can't be humble. And a humble person can't be proud of their humility. We have to come to the point where we understand that we are sinners in need of saving grace. We are sinners who cannot please God. It is outside the realm of possibility, but God, loving us, sent his own son to die for us, called us to himself and redeemed us and transformed us through Jesus Christ. Now, having mentioned those three, let me, let me just talk about the Garden of Eden a little bit. Not in your notes, but in Genesis chapter 3, it just shows the pride of life. God put a tree in the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He put a bunch of other trees in the garden, including the tree of life. Adam and Eve weren't in the garden very long, and all of a sudden, they were drawn to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, that's my tree. Don't you ever touch it. The day you eat it is the day you'll die. Well, like a little child, you just tell them, that chair's off limits. That's my chair. A little kid's going to go, there's 200 chairs in here, but that one. That one's beckoning me. There's nothing inherently special about that. There was nothing inherently special about the tree. It was a tree. It was God's tree. And God said, that's my tree. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. The day you eat it, you're going to die. And Adam and Eve go up and they, oh, that's a tree. How close can I get without sinning? And then Satan comes on the scene in the form of a serpent and he says to the woman, did God really say you should not eat from the tree, any tree in the garden? He adds to the word of God. Oh, but Eve adds to the scriptures by saying, God said, don't even touch it or you'll die. And so Satan says, you know, uh, you won't really die. First of all, did God really say it? Second, God's a liar. Third, because God knows that on the day that you eat of it, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. Doubting God's word, doubting his truthfulness, 
and calling God afraid of man. Somehow minimizing who God is. And Eve then tells us the 1 John 2 portion because it says in the scriptures, and she saw that it was pleasing to the eye. And good for food. And able to make one wise. So she took it. And she ate it. And then she gave it to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. That's how addictions start. You look at it and say, "Mm, that's pretty pretty. That's pretty nice. I think I like that. And then you touch it. Oh, I think I like the feel of that. I think I like the taste of that. This is really beneficial to me. My life is better because of. And you are gone at that moment. Gone at that moment. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life are involved in addictions. All addictions fit into one or more categories that we've already mentioned. One of those three categories, all addictions fit into them. Substance abuse. When we think of addictions, we mostly think of substance abuse. Those poor people addicted to drugs and alcohol, they're the ones that really have it bad. Prescription drug abuse. I read an article that said in the last few years, prescription drug abuse has risen 500%. Illegal drugs, alcohol, huffing, cigarettes, it's all addictive, and it's addictive substances that enslave us. Substance abuse. Physical abuse. When we think of physical abuse, we think about someone abusing others. That is part of physical abuse. But physical abuse is also internal. It's about me. Physical abuse comes in the form of starvation, otherwise known as anorexia. Gluttony or bulimia, where you binge and purge. Gluttony. Self-injury or self-abuse. It also has to do with the abuse of others. Some people are addicted to hurting other people. Sometimes that comes out in anger and rage. Those are physical abuse symptoms, and there are more. This is not an exhaustive list. Sexual involvement outside of marriage. We have an epidemic of this. Adultery pornography, homosexuality. This includes all sexual perversions. Premarital sex, the sex rate among teenagers in the church and outside of the church is exactly the same. Our teens and parents, by the way, if you don't think your teens know about sex, take your head out of the dirt and and get real. They already know more than you think they know and maybe more than you know because so much more is available today to them. Premarital sex, including touching the private parts of another person prior to marriage. Self-pleasuring. Flirtatious behavior. We've really got to watch this one because this is the gateway to sexual sins. Flirtatious behavior by men or women. Immodest dress, fantasizing about sex, all these things are habits that can become consuming. And one I think that has flown under the radar that we're going to bring above the radar is technology abuse. Technology abuse. Obsessing over the cell phone. Parents, what happens when you take your kid's cell phone away? Oh, I'd never take it away. It'd be too terrible. I don't need to say anything else. Compulsive texting. Um, I might rant a little bit on this. Uh, Mindless surfing. Here 
and I'm, I'll probably offend people, but I'll, this series is meant to. Um, <laughs> kids, teenagers, do not need to be looking on their phone at church unless they're asked to by their youth group leader, their teacher, or the pastor, or the parent. Just shut them off when you get here. Just shut them off. There's no reason for them to be on. Kids walking in with their, their earbuds in, blasting tunes, oblivious to other people. This is a place for fellowship. You cannot fellowship with the music blasting in your ears. Just shut it off. Put them in your pocket and leave them off until the, the church time's done. You don't need it. But the problem is that we are so addicted to instant messaging, Facebook, uh, texting, uh, those impersonal personal relationships, that we feel like we're going through withdrawal if we're not checking it every five minutes or, or more. Mindless surfing. You just sit down, you actually look for something that you need to look for on the computer and then you're drifting off into other things you shouldn't be going to. Mindless surfing. Obsession with video games. Watching too much TV or inappropriate TV and the list can go on. We have a whole technology system that's addicting people today. And if you watch the TV programs, you deserve it. You deserve the smartest smartphone, the latest technology. I'm not against technology. I think it's a wonderful thing that's here to stay. But like anything that was given to us for our pleasure, it can be abused. Mark Shaw, in his book, little booklet called Hope and Help for, the, for Video, Game, TV, and Internet Addiction, wrote this. And you might think it's funny, but this is real, real stuff. It's reality. Via an internet virtual world game, one man created an imaginary persona, got an imaginary job, met an imaginary female, married her in an imaginary virtual internet world, and ended up divorcing his real-life wife several months later. He had determined that his female friend who created the imaginary character that married him was a better friend and virtual spouse than his legal wife. That is virtually uncool. Because it's not reality. You and me, face to face, that's reality. Facebook is not reality. Texting isn't even reality. Email. Now, I, I, do, I do counseling and by email and texting and Skype, so I'm not against technology. But have you ever noticed how easy it is for people to be offended by your words because they do not hear your inflection in the typing? We can misread, literally misread things so easily that if somebody sends back a short uh, quip on, on the email, uh, we are offended that it's not longer and bigger explanation and we don't understand. Maybe they were busy. Maybe they had a bunch of other things going on in their life. We just miss all of the, we'll call it the halo data around the event. So many people have lost friendships over email or Facebook. Have you, have you seen the, the Facebook guys on TV talking back and forth? It's hilarious. Um, it's, it's so impersonal. They're standing there without any personality, just talking back and forth. That's the way our lives have gotten. Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. And Jesus said, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. We, we do what we do because it's already inside of us. And this defiles a person, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. We do what we do because it's in us. And what we do only reveals what's in us.
Every addiction is a ruling sin to which one has yielded his or her thoughts, deeds, and time. Every addiction is a ruling sin to which one has yielded his, his or her thoughts, deeds, and time. Psalm 52, 7. See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. The accumulation of wealth is addictive. The accumulation of possessions is addictive. And Jesus said very clearly, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In Romans 6, verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Whatever we give our lives to, we are slaves. Here's the issue. We will never go through life not being a slave. We were designed to be slaves. We are either going to be slaves of God or slaves of sin. Our, our modern languages, our, our, our Bibles today and our English have have watered that down by calling it bond servants. It's the word doulos and it means slave. There's not a separate word. There is a separate word and it's totally different for bond servant. The word doulos in the Greek is slave. It is a person who does not have control of their own circumstances. They are controlled by a master. And they serve the master. We will either serve sin or we will serve God. We were made to serve. Serving God's a whole lot better. Because Jesus said, if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Doesn't mean free to do whatever you want, but it means free to finally do what God wants. Because when I'm a slave of sin, I don't do what I want or what God wants. I do what the enemy wants. I'm a slave to sin. Every addiction begins when one believes a lie. And the lie is, this will somehow be good or pleasurable for me. Now, we think, well, this makes me miserable. Not at the moment you're doing it. No matter what you feel after you've done it, at the moment that you're participating in that sinful addiction, that sinful habit, at that moment, you are deriving pleasure. And at that moment, you're not thinking about the pain that's going to come. What you're weighing out is, which is more important, the pleasure I can have right now or the pain I'll endure afterwards. And we deduce that right now, the pleasure is more important. That's an addiction. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Speaking of, of false prophets and ungodly men who are preaching a false Christ, Peter said these words, For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And we, we make this, it might even not, not even be a conscious decision, but we make this decision at the moment that we have to, cho to choose, we make this decision, either I'm going to reject what I'm tempted to do and flee to God, or I'm going to be involved in what I'm tempted to do, and I'll face the consequences later. At that moment, we weigh in a balance what's right and the consequences of wrong. And when we choose to sin, we say, the consequences 
of wrong are worth my pleasure now. That's addiction. That's enslavement. And the, the goal of this series is to help identify enslavement in our lives and find victory in Jesus Christ. Because we don't have to live as slaves of sin. Jesus Christ has set us free from those things that enslave us. And yet, so many people, including Christians, are enslaved by sin. Every sin is the result of believing the lie. Psalm 5.9. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Why do we have commercials? I mean, people, Super Bowl's right around the corner. I'm not betting on the Packers to make it. I'm not betting on anything anyway, but they're toast, okay? I'm just going to be an optimist and say somebody else is going to win. If they make it, I'll cheer, but not likely. But somebody's going to pay a million or more dollars for a 15-second or 30-second commercial. And what they've done is they said, it's worth me investing a million dollars in this 30 seconds because I know people are watching, and I'm going to make this so that they believe they have to have it. They can't live without it. That's advertising. Advertising appeals to our ability to become addicts. It appeals to that. It appeals to our flesh. It, it, it's lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. All advertising appeals to that. I, I, I get sporting magazines, hunting magazines. They're trying to sell me new guns on every other page. I like them. <laughs> okay, I can't afford my addiction. But they're trying to lure me to buy this greatest and best new weapon. They appeal to the flesh. Nothing inherently wrong in looking at them and saying, boy, that's a nice, nice weapon, nice gun. I, I could see how I could use that, but I'm not going to do it. We've used this statement around here. I, I don't know who ever said it first. It wasn't me. I'm not that smart. But they, this is the statement. Sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay, and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. That's sin. It appeals to our flesh. 1 Peter 2.19 again, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. All addictions are theological at heart. If we understand that, that addiction to sin is a theological matter, it's not simply correcting our theology. It's repenting and changing and having the right view of God and his word. But all sin, all addiction is theological in nature. Addictions come from the flesh that is our sinful nature which is naturally against God. Our sinful nature does not warm up to God. Our sinful nature, like Adam in the garden, hides from God. Our sinful nature, like Adam in the garden, blames God for getting us into that situation. God, it's this woman that you gave me. In other words, God, you gave me an inferior product. If you had given me the right type of woman, I wouldn't have sinned. By the way, that's what leads our, our whole divorce system. If you'd given me a better partner, I realize that, that some sin, some divorces are not what everybody wants. But the vast majority is uh, divorce is so easy today that if you have irreconcilable differences, you can go get divorced. Uh, this is an inferior product. I'm looking for my soulmate. <sighs> 
If you find someone that you get along with perfectly all the time, one of you is not needed in that relationship. <laughs> Husband-wife relationships have to have some conflict. Because it is the wife's job used by God to sharpen us men. And it is the men's job spiritually to wash our wives with the water of the word. We're needed in each other's lives, and because we're sinners, there's going to be resistance, conflict. It shouldn't be every moment that you're awake, but there should be some conflict. It's healthy. Galatians 5, 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. As a Christian, I want to please God. And my flesh says, oh no, it's more fun not to. Pleasing God is boring. That's my flesh speaking. The Spirit of God within me says, if you do that thing with the flesh... If you please your flesh, you're toast. Be sure your sin will find you out. I'm weighing that out going, I think I'm afraid of people finding out my sin, so I'm going toward God. Or I weigh it out and say, I don't care if people find out. I'm doing this. That battle with the flesh will happen until the day we die. Because we live in a sin-cursed world. It's not an excuse to sin. It is the reality that none of us can stand without Christ. You can't do it. And even in Christ, the flesh is so strong that we will sin. The flesh, the sinful nature, wants to please itself more than anything. I know me. I want to please me, and I want my wife to please me. I want my children to please me. I want you all to please me. I mean, if everybody pleased me, I would be pleased. <laughs> and you're going to go home and go, that's me. I, I, I wanna, it, life would be great if everybody did just what I want them to do. When I want them to do it. How I want them to do it. And then thank me for letting them do it. <laughs> I want people to please me. Right? If you're not that way, you're lying to yourself. You want people to please you. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, Divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And then he adds this thing. And if I've left anything out of that list, they're covered there too. They're all under this one thing of pleasing the flesh. And when I please the flesh, I will never please God. It's impossible. I cannot please my flesh and please God. I can please God and derive pleasure from that. But my first and foremost goal is not the pleasure of self. It's the pleasure of God. If you're trying to live for the Lord, you have found this true that pleasing God is not always pleasurable. Right? So if all we're trying to do is please God so that we derive some pleasure from Him, we have, we have kidded ourselves into believing that God is only the dispenser of pleasure. The fact is that being a Christian is tough. Being a Christian and sacrificing the things I want go against my nature. They go against your nature. See, the addict worships false gods instead of the one true God. The addict is a worshiper. doesn't matter what the addiction is. He or she is a worshiper. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul said, Put to death, 
therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Worship. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 5, state this. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Wow. You mean I can't just go on in my sin? No, you cannot. That's why this series is so important. God loves you enough to call you to repentance. Mark Shaw, in his book, The Heart of Addiction, wrote, Idolatry can be applied to any pleasure that becomes so excessively desired that it replaces the desire to worship God. Both the love or pleasure and the avoidance of pain, love of pleasure and the avoidance of pain or escape fuel any addiction. We can either love pleasure, which fuels addiction, or we can want to avoid pain, which fuels the addiction, but either way, we become addicts. Salvation and repentance are the only hope for the one enslaved to sin. Salvation and repentance. You're going to hear that a lot through this series, but salvation and repentance are the only hope and help for the one who is enslaved. Again, Stephen Kathy Gallagher wrote, we must tell God that we have sinned against him and against others. That should not be done as some secret formula to receiving forgiveness, but with a heartfelt sorrow over the wrongfulness of our actions, godly sorrow leading to true repentance. And the last verse I want to close with is Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. There was this debate going on about how bad a sinner we are compared to others. And Jesus is saying, look, you don't need to compare yourself to other people because you can always find somebody worse than yourself. I'm not so bad when I think about, (laughs) neither was Attila the Hun, but that doesn't make him a good person. What we need to do is begin to compare ourselves with God and find how far short we've fallen. And then we get a good reality check. Luke 13, 1 through 5, there was some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, and he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is not about us thinking we're better than somebody else. This is about all of us saying, I'm a sinner. We're sinners in need of grace. We're sinners in need of forgiveness. We're sinners in need of reconciliation to the holy God. We are sinners in need of a right relationship with the living God, the King of Kings. So your application is pretty easy this time. It'll get a little progressively, uh, I don't want to say difficult, but um, more involved as we go along. But there will be homework um, application this time is, I, I, number one, I expect this series to help me in the following ways. And then you just write out briefly what you expect this series to do for you. Number two, I, I thought of someone who needs a series. Don't tell me it didn't. Right? And you weren't pointing the fingers first at yourself. 
You were thinking, boy, my brother-in-law needs this. Or my sister needs this. Or that guy or that woman I work with, they really need this. Or, man, my, my wife needs this. Or my husband needs this. You were thinking about somebody else. Be honest, who was it? Don't, don't tell me right now, but just <laughs> write it down there. Write their name. Uh, number three, I will pray for them and ask them to join me for next Sunday. Oh, I couldn't do that. Are you going to be stingy with the hope? God wasn't stingy with his hope. Father, thank you for your grace in our lives, for your forgiveness, for reconciliation that comes through Christ. We thank you, Father, that you've given us hope, that you sent Jesus Christ to die for sinners. And that was a demonstration of your love. And so we thank you, Father, for loving sinners. Enemies. And you made them friends and you made them children. So we praise you, God, for not giving up on us, but bringing us here to this point so we can come face to face with who we are before the living God. Transform our hearts and our thoughts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.